have a big busy day and then you just can't seem to get going the next day? Well, those are the storms today. After yesterday's multi-million dollar mess maker, today's worst case scenario didn't develop. The storms are popping way down south. They are moving toward Denver. We'll let you know if things get serious. Now, the potential for panic people to get taken by roof scams is always pretty real on a day like this. A next viewer named Betsy Lay was having none of it. Her sign reads, we already have a roofing company and a security system. Please. No solicitation. If you need work done, you know the drill. Go local, avoid the disaster chasers, get your details in writing, and only pay when you're satisfied with the work. There are no shortcuts worth taking when you're repairing storm damage, but not so in legislating. Shortcuts abound for our elected leaders at the state capitol, scrambling now because they left some of the most important work for last. Politics guy Brandon Riddiman shows us the games that they're playing before tomorrow's deadline. Hey, Kyle, tomorrow is the last day of the legislative session, which means we're in the middle of what I like to call their Calvin ball time. For the uninitiated, that's the game in the cartoon Calvin and Hobbes where the rules are never the same as they were before. It's funny on the funny pages. A little less humorous when lawmakers do it. They have a bunch of rules they normally have to follow, like giving every bill a public hearing where any member of the public can show up to tell lawmakers exactly what they think of the bill. But in crunch time, the legislature lets itself out of that rule. Here's how that looked if you watched the House floor on TV this morning. Our education committee members, we are going to be meeting as uh, we go into a brief recess. To hear Senate Bill 61. Here in the well. <laughs> in the well. Those are the key words. Let's speed up a little and ah, there they are. The education committee holding their big hearing on that bill. Let's listen in to the debate. Oh, right, you can't. Surely at least the news reporters can listen so they can tell you what's going on. Nope, not allowed in this part of the chamber. They're over there, waiting at the press table to find out what happened. After a little while, the fine folks at Colorado Channel switch over to a shot of the chandelier, which rocks around a lot more than you would think when you speed it up. And frankly, tells you as much about what's going on as the lawmakers are anyway. Eventually, later, in a different debate, one of them told us what happened. Um, I just want to... Uh, commend the work of the Education Committee. They met this morning around the well, and um, they postponed indefinite, uh, indefinitely. Sorry, but like many of you, I've been up all night. I don't know why. Uh, and that, that bill was toxic. Now, they do this because those rules designed to make the legislature open and transparent are rules the legislature can change. They can't change their final deadline, though. That's in the state constitution. But this is an old practice used by both parties that ends up cutting people out of big issues because a lot of times the big issues are the hardest ones to get a compromise on, and they save them to last. The legislature is proud. It's done things like opening itself up by allowing people to testify remotely from all over Colorado on certain bills. They can be a little less proud of this, but, Kyle, it's how the sausage gets made every year <laughs> in crunch time. I just hear an elected official praise herself for meeting in public to not pass something. In, in kind of public. That's yeah. the thing. Okay. All you right. don't get to hear what they say. All right. Very good. Brandon, thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Could I get everyone to stand, please, and give a round of applause for our incredible staff? Thank you so much. Now on that, we agree with the legislators. Dozens of state employees found themselves working unexpectedly until 2 a.m. About two dozen legislative staffers were working until closing time. No overtime for them, just part of the job. We checked. There were five custodial staffers who had to stay until 3 in the morning. They got paid time and a half. Two state troopers stayed on to keep the Capitol protected until 2 a.m. They'll cash in those hours later. We appreciate them working late through no fault of their own. Our next question is about the people working late at night at the Capitol after the legislators leave. Remember this false claim by Democratic House Speaker Chrysanta Duran? You know, a lot of time who's working behind the scenes in the hotels and the restaurants and who comes here late at night to do the cleanup work in this Capitol and clean up after all of us. Do you know who those people are? Sometimes they are undocumented individuals. There's no evidence that there are people here illegally working for the state. We told you that the state government uses the I-9 system where employers vouch for their employees' paperwork. And Nita asked, why doesn't Colorado use the much more stringent E-Verify system? Good question, Nita. The state tried using E-Verify and found that it was a huge pain in the posterior. 
The city of Colorado Springs, known for its conservative politics, even came in to say that the system was too cumbersome. University of Colorado and Arapahoe County testified as well. There were large financial institutions that refused to jump through all the necessary hoops, so state and local agencies feared that they would be paying more for loans and such. Other state contractors were willing to put their employees through E-Verify, but they couldn't vouch for all their subs. Long story short, Colorado moved away from E-Verify in 2008. Companies and local governments can now use it if they choose. Four top fugitive hunters at the U.S. Marshal Service in Denver are being told to get lost. Three are being transferred to D.C., another one to Atlanta. Those meddling kids on the Nine Wants to Know team found out why. I wonder if it has something to do with this internal email from the U.S. Marshal Service asking employees to vote for deputy of the quarter. Well, that seems like harmless fun. Then you read a little bit more. Candidate one, Tom Rohn. Tom can only hold his alcohol like a high school girl after a few apple pucker shots. Candidate two, Blue Jones. F this place. I nominate myself. Blue's language continues as he talks of his, quote, daily desire to suck start my service issued sidearm. Randy's the third nominee with a life-size doll picture. And the winner was Blue Jones, in case you were interested. Do you want to buy him a card? The department heads there at the U.S. Marshal Service are being held accountable for the behavior of the deputies at the Denver office. There's also a newsletter called The Voice with some more colorful content. If you're into that kind of thing, it's in this story on the next page on 9news.com. Child marriage sounds like a problem from another era, or at least another place on Earth. But the people who fight child marriage say it's still a problem in America. Whitney Wilde, part of that pesky nine wants to know team that keeps finding facts, went through Colorado's marriage data and found that there are thousands of cases of teenagers marrying teenagers and teenagers marrying adults. There were about 5,000 kids, boys and girls, who were under 18 years old who got married between 2000 and 2015. We don't know who they are because state data doesn't tell us that. But what we do know is that the boys were always at least 16 years old, and some of those teen girls were marrying older men, in some cases as old as 31 years old. And about once a year, a girl under 15 years old got married. They cannot easily leave home, access a shelter, Frady Reese is an advocate against child marriage. Her nonprofit, Unchained at Last, is working nationwide to raise the minimum age of marriage to 18 years old. There is no minimum age for this kind of marriage in Colorado. The law in the books today says someone under 18 can petition for marriage. Kids as young as 16 need either parents or guardians to consent, or a judge alone can approve it. Kids 15 and younger need parents or guardians and a judge to say it's okay. Children can easily be forced into a marriage or forced to stay in a marriage. Regardless of whether the kid wants to get married or not, there's, there's some coercive element there. Um, and uh, because the kid can't really make that kind of a decision on his or her own. Dr. Max Wachtel says the damaging effects of some underage marriages can last a lifetime. Honestly, one of the biggest uh, unintended impacts for you know, kids getting married to each other or you know, getting married to somebody who is older is uh, you know, maybe pushing the kid into sexual activity before he or she is ready for it. He says the biggest problem is that kids have few ways to leave. That feeling of being trapped, a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression can come up. Advocates worry that with no minimum age, there's no real safety net, and that will mean that boys and girls are falling into dangerous relationships. For next, Whitney Wild. Now here's what's more perplexing about the trend. The minimum common law marriage age here is 18 years old. That law went into effect in 2006. Today, while we were out shooting video, someone, something rather, was shooting video of us. So we shot video of them shooting video of us. Very meta. Our producer, Cody, spotted a drone while on the pedestrian bridge over I-25 near Evans recently. You know, that's cool. Hey, listen, you want to watch us? Whatever. What's not cool? Flying a drone over an interstate. Trust us, we checked with the FAA on this. Listen, you can peep on Cody all you want. He is a good-looking man. But you cannot do it over I-25. If you're curious, you want to file a complaint about this, who do you call? Not simple. Denver 911 says call the FAA. The FAA says call 911. Just a big circle. In Denver, police will only investigate if drones are over parks or parkways because that is against city ordinance. The Denver Fire Department performed a high angle rescue at the convention center downtown this morning. We're thinking, what? Who is climbing up on top of the convention center? It was a maintenance employee. He was on the roof doing storm cleanup and slipped on a ladder. He's going to be okay. No, there's nobody running around doing parkour or whatever that is. 
That's where our minds went as well. Seeking shelter from the storm, you have to watch the porta potty. Our Colorado confessions continue with a substitute teacher who may or may not have the same class of kids every day, but keeps seeing the same thing. And just how much your neighbor should know about when and how you vote. Next. Where would you be willing to hide to ride out a hailstorm like yesterday's? Maybe you're thinking that portable storage container on the left. Nope, it's locked. Nobody's in there. Yep, he had to go for the porta potty instead. Peeked his head out and realized, I like it better in here than I do out there. Catherine Kuhn spotted this video for us from her balcony at Commons West Park. The most Colorado thing we saw today is someone who was willing to go out and risk the hail to protect a mama goose protecting her eggs. You know, these geese are all over town now on their nests at shopping centers and in parking lots. This is at the Belmar Shopping Center during yesterday's hailstorm. Two people out there with umbrellas protecting the geese. And well, we went out and they weren't happy to see us, but then again, there wasn't a hailstorm they needed to dodge. We love those red umbrellas. Yes, we do. And the weather really is for the birds. The culprit, this area of low pressure spinning in the southwest, but it is finally on the move. One more soggy, cool day with storms and then a major shift in the weather pattern. Heavy showers and thunderstorms coming up from the south. Now one new storm that's just popped up out by DIA in Aurora. We do still think we'll see some showers and thunder here in Denver yet tonight. The moisture coming from the south to the north. No watches or warnings in and around the city, but we'll keep an eye on that one out by the airport. We have mostly cloudy skies out there and we do anticipate rain will be a factor tonight and again tomorrow. Tomorrow will be a whole lot cooler with temperatures in the 50s as the front drops south and that low is on the move. But once it shifts east, East, warmer, drier weather will settle in for Thursday, Friday, and the weekend. But tonight, an active evening of weather. The potential for severe weather still there. Showers and thunder in Denver late into the night, and then heavy rain likely tomorrow. In the metro area, there are no advisories to speak of, but I'd hang on to that umbrella. Cloudy with temperatures in the mid 40s tonight. The rain chance increases actually tomorrow, and the rain could turn heavy at times with temperatures cooler than average. It gets better. Thursday's warmer and drier with just isolated storms. Friday's spectacular. Low 80s for the upcoming holiday weekend with just isolated storms for Mother's Day. And up in the high country, we've been tracking snow all afternoon, Kyle, at about 9,000 feet. Kathy, thanks. You know, teaching is hard work, perhaps harder 
when you're in a different classroom each day or each week. Our series of Colorado Confessions continues with the words of a substitute teacher. My name is Pam and this is my confession as a substitute teacher. I've been a substitute for 10 years. I substitute anywhere from kindergarten through high school, although I like high school the best. Um, teenagers are a lot of fun and I don't know if you've ever seen the bumper sticker that says, hire a teenager while they still know everything. It's uh, middle school. Oh, they're evil. Uh, they think they're adults and they're not. They're not realize that they're still acting like kids and they don't listen to anybody. I've learned three things as a substitute. First, nobody has ever had homework. So when you say, do you have homework to work in a class? Nobody's ever done it. Same thing with makeup assignments. Nobody's ever had one. And the last and most important thing is nobody has ever gone to the bathroom in between classes because everybody has to go as soon as they get there. You walk into a classroom and uh, maybe there's a good plan, maybe there's not. The kids are all thinking, aha, a sub, it's party time. You think about um, what's worth reacting to and what's not. What's uh, annoying and what's really um, hindering the educational process. So you try to ignore a lot of stuff so you don't spend the day yelling at them and just enjoy them. I want them to know that all their school days are important and even if their regular teacher isn't there, um, it's still a day that's part of their education so be nice to your substitute. I'm Pam and that was my confession as a substitute teacher. I love Pam's voice. If there's something you need to say that we all need to hear, we will hide you behind emotionally appropriate emojis to get it done. Send us your confession. Email next at 9news.com or get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. Denver-style traffic expands to another spot in Colorado for a familiar reason. And voters have new options next year. Just note, the choice you make will be public. That goes for us journalists who cover politics, too. Next. May make a recommendation, something that you know is not our journalism, but is definitely worth your time. The Coloradans' recent story on traffic in northern Colorado is an eye-opener. We think about it so often as a Denver problem. The real estate market in the Fort Collins area is also exploding, and the cost of housing is forcing people to move to communities outside of Fort Collins proper. Now that in turn means longer commutes and rush hour traffic appearing where there once was very little. It's an interesting read. There's a link on the next Facebook page. Unaffiliated voters across Colorado will be able to pick a party primary, Democrat or Republican, and participate next year if they want. We voted to allow that back in November. But just know, your choice of party will be public record. Your choice and mine. We got some smart people together to talk about that today. Joined here around this table by three perspectives. Colorado Secretary of State Wayne Williams, a Republican. Alton Dillard, who's a spokesperson for the Denver Clerk and Recorder. Deborah Johnson, who is a Democrat. And Corey Hutchins, who writes for the Columbia Journalism Review, as well as the Colorado Independent. An unaffiliated. Correct. Unaffiliated reporter, as am I. Secretary of State Williams, let me start with you. Sure. If I am an unaffiliated voter, which I am, and I want to participate in a party primary, which I do, why is that the public's business which primary I participate in? So first, the public always has a right to know in Colorado who votes in which election. That's always been the case in Colorado. We never tell people, comrade, you didn't get enough votes, they voted for somebody else, but we won't tell you who voted in the election. The Denver Clerk and Recorder's Office has some concerns about this. Why? Uh, one of the main reasons we're concerned about it is just because unaffiliated are the largest voting block in the uh, state of Colorado. So our concerns are a little more based on the cost and possible voter confusion about having to send two ballots to people. We've been interacting with voters, of course, during our entire uh, career, and you'd be surprised the way they get turned around on certain things. If someone does not provide identification, they're supposed to send us a copy of a valid form of ID. You'd be surprised how many actual IDs we get. You'd be surprised how many credit cards we get sent. Oh my. You do have to, you know, bring the a message to the voters in a way they can understand it. And Corey, this is an issue that is of particular interest to people who cover politics and then people who troll people who cover politics on Twitter and via email. A lot of political reporters, though not all, are registered unaffiliated. We try not 
not to be biased. We try to be even handed. And now we're presented with this question. How are reporters handling it? Uh, I've spoke to uh, several reporters at the Capitol today. Capitol Press Corps, I would say, is uh, perhaps not evenly split, but there's a divide between some folks who are unaffiliated voters who say, I'm uh, excited for the opportunity to participate in the primaries for the first time as an unaffiliated voter, but I won't do it because I don't want precisely what you brought up, what you raised to happen. So I think people are certainly, reporters certainly fear that that's something, I believe that would happen here in Colorado, given the culture of social media today and this new kind of era we're in where no one trusts journalists anyway. Wayne Williams, Alton Dillard, Corey Hutchins, thank you all for being here. Anybody who's interested in the full discussion that we've had here today, we'll have it on the next YouTube channel. Much more to that conversation. I invite you to check it out. You get the last word, as always, next. The confession of a substitute teacher struck a chord with Terry Smith, who said, loved it. Know that all too well. Sammy writes, my mom's in the hospital. Doesn't stop us from watching next. Sammy's mom, I wish you a speedy recovery. And Jack McMichael, I give in next. I wasn't a fan at first, but you turned me. That's how we're doing it, one at a time. See you next time. Yeah.